Christ, welcome to this morning's worship service. I think all the announcements are well defined in your bulletin. Are there any announcements that need to be made, Alan? I have three. I want to remind everyone the sign up sheet for the uh, pitch in on the July 28th is in the narthex now. Uh, you may remember um, uh, about a month and a half ago that uh, we had the uh, script committee asked people to buy uh, AMC script cards because they were giving 10% back to the church. We have three of them left at $25 each, and the Kiwanis Club provided us with a whole bunch of county fair schedules, um, and they're in the narthex for free. Thank you. All right, any other announcements that need to be made? Well, we're very happy that Reverend Cocker is with us this morning and we're going to lead us uh, to worship also, um, Miriam is going to help us with the first song, so we're very happy about that in just a moment. Well, let's begin this worship with silence. <clears throat> Join me in the call to worship found in your bulletin. Almighty God, we pray for your blessing on the church in this place. Hear me, faithful of my salvation, and in the careless be awakened. Here may the doubting find faith and the anxious be encouraged. Here may the tempted find help and the sorrow comfort. Here may the weary find rest and the strong be renewed. Here may the aged find consolation, and the young be inspired, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please stand if you're able and sing with us the first <coughs> hymn, number 487, When Morning Gilts the Skies. Much as we are in and 
and cleanse us from our sin. For we are no way God's transgression, and our sin is ever before us. Create us clean hearts, O God, and renew the land of the dead with them. Cast us not away from the presence, and take not the Holy Spirit from us. And in this we are assured of our pardon. But this we call to mind, and therefore we have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. God's mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is God's faithfulness. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Amen. Amen. <laughs> All right, do we have any youngsters here today? I don't, we might have a couple. Help build the house? No. <laughs> you stayed home? At the house we were. You stayed at a house there? Oh, you did. Did your grandparents go with you? The same house we were at last. Oh, really? And did your mom help build the house, the new houses? One night. One night. Oh, okay. Well, that must have been fun, huh? How are you doing, Stone? Good. Do you know, um, has anybody ever hurt your feelings? Yeah. Okay, do you like being mad at them when they hurt your feelings? Yeah. The, what? Sometimes. Sometimes, okay. Has anybody ever hurt your feelings, Logan? Not that I know. Not that you know. <laughs> has anybody ever hurt your feelings? Who hurt your feelings? Did Logan ever hurt your feelings? Yeah, just one time. Only he hurts your feet. Oh. Well, well, well. Hey, guys, get up here. We're talking about when your parents hurt your feelings. <laughs> Come on, guys. Hi, Carter. How are you? Oh, Bethy wants to see you. Did I tell you that? Do you remember her? Do you remember my mom? You don't remember? She wants to see you. She said that. So, hey, do you know what forgiveness means, Logan? What? What does it mean? Uh, <coughs> that one. Too long. Forgot. You forgot. Has anybody ever hurt your feelings? Uh, huh? No. No. That's a lovely thought. Have, have you ever anybody ever hurt your feelings and made you sad? No. Okay. You have wonderful parents. Has anybody ever hurt your feelings and made you sad? <laughs> My grandma. <laughs> Is that the one that smokes cigarettes? <laughs> Do you want her to start? No. I'm just asking. I'm not saying she should do it. I'm not saying she shouldn't either. Okay. So when somebody hurts your feelings, do you like to be mad at him? Like you hurt my grandma's feelings. Aww. Oh. I, I hurt your grandma's feelings? <laughs> do, you, do you know how much I care? <laughs> <laughs> Can you count that many times? Your grandma's a nice old woman. I like her. <laughs> old woman. <laughs> but she looks old. <laughs> Is your grandpa old man too? I didn't say he was old, I just said he looks old. You said he was old? No, you did. Why did? Jim, I don't think you're that old. You and I are about the same age, you know. Yeah, I keep making fun of people eating grandpa food and they go, that's what I eat sometimes. Anyway. Well, 
sometimes we, we have to tell, you know, sometimes people hurt our feelings, okay? And, and what Jesus wants us to do when sometimes people hurt our feelings is to forgive them. Now, do you know what that word means? I forgive Okay, and what is it? All of them. You forgive all of them? I believe that because you're the perfect little girl. <laughs> and ever since the Hamels daughter left, that's true, she, you know, the perfect one, you have replaced her. <laughs> it's, oh, I'm not kidding you. I'm not kidding you. Um, yeah. So you will now be the perfect. I'm telling you, I'm not a little girl. You're not, I'm, she says, I'm telling you, I'm not a little girl. Okay. Well, sometimes when people hurt our feelings, we can do two things. We can always remember that they hurt our feelings, right, Stone? And how does that make you feel? Sad. Or you can forgive them, and that, in your case, it means forget that they hurt your feelings so that you can be what? So which would you rather be, happy or sad? Happy. So if you want to be happy for the rest of your life, always remember to forgive people that have hurt you. That's a really important thing. One time your friend hurt your feelings. She runs away from your feelings. She runs away from you. Okay, and you go to school in Alexville? No. Oh, okay. She, she runs away. away. I'm sorry. All right. And somebody said, you're counting down, aren't you, David? <laughs> yep. Yeah, well. Uh, number seven, is it? Yes. Uh, that said, are there any other concerns that we need to be mindful of? Good to see you. Haven't seen you. You're in yeah. Canada now, yeah? Quebec? Yeah. yeah. Montreal. Yeah. Is it Quebec? Yeah. Montreal. Yes. Montreal. Okay. Yeah. All right. Karim, it's good to see you. Johanna, good, good to see really. you. Come in late along with your daughter. Is she? I <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you came in time to give your money. So. <laughs> All right, let's turn our attention to prayer. Gracious and heavenly God, we, we lift you up and praise you and give thanks to your holy name. We give thanks that you are taking us through this spectacular summer, um, that this is a summer of growth and renewal. This is a time of... Uh, 
of abundance, and particularly in this part of the country, and so we thank you for that. Gracious and holy God, we also come to you <coughs> mindful that our country is, is just that. It is a country, and, and what happens, even at the smallest level, affects the, uh, at the largest level. And we're mindful of, yet again, uh, a question of race and a um, question of racism. And again, we would ask that you would abide with us as a country. We try and sort all this out. We ask that you be with the... Uh, the family of Trayvon Martin, that you, you be with, um, with the family of Mr. Zimmerman and all people involved. In fact, we do not know what happened, only you do. And fortunately, we rely on your justice and your judgment in times like this. And gracious and heavenly God, we ask also that you be with all of our friends in all places of violence Particularly, um, we would ask that you be with the members of this fellowship who find themselves in harm's way, not only in the Middle East, but in the middle of the cities here in the United States that somehow uh, are unable to live civilized lives. We would ask that you would abide with, with all people and that somehow peace could be given a chance, and that somehow we might not study war anymore. But in the meantime, what we can study is the way to treat our fellow neighbors, the way to treat our children and our, our spouses, the way to treat our own bodies, <coughs> our own selves. We would ask that we would look favorably upon all people, that we would be long-suffering and long-forgiving. Gracious and heavenly God, we give thee thanks for this fellowship. We give thee thanks for the healing that comes with being part of this fellowship. We're mindful of friends of this church who are not well physically, who are not well emotionally, who are not well um, mentally. And we would ask that your kindness might um, be infused in their, in their lives and that your clarity and that your gentleness and that your healing might become a reality for those who suffer. Gracious and heavenly God, we're grateful for this good day and we ask that you would receive this our prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you so much. We continue now the sharing of our tithes and our offerings.
Oh God, for all of the blessings that you have given us, we thank you for these blessings which we bring back to your church. We thank you. We ask that you inspire us to use these gifts so that your kingdom may become greater here and in the rest of the world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you to David, Reverend Kummer, for these 22 years, and he has been extremely supportive of me in having my piano studio downstairs when I was getting my doctorate at IU, and that was such a blessing, and he encouraged the session, and they agreed. Not that they were opposed, but <laughs> he really supported me all these years, and then I, after graduation, which was in 2000, um, I think it was in 2006, actually, that I asked if I could put my studio for the students in the church, and David said, well, I think so. <laughs> and so he presented it before the session, and I was granted this privilege. I want to thank you, David. And I want to thank him for making the scriptures just bounce off the page. You know, we're there with you, and it's been deeply inspiring and really keeps us awake. You know, we can't doze off. Not that we would, but... <laughs> <laughs> this ensemble of pieces I dedicate to you, David, and I will be playing this on television this uh, Wednesday at Lissy Broadcasting Live. I'm a partner in faith with Lissy, and um, they're interviewing me, and then I'm going to play this arrangement. It's only five minutes long, but it has the walk that we have in Christ, the salvation, the cross. As Billy Graham said, I want to be known for the cross. The cross. So we start there, then we go into the garden in the resurrection, and then we make a choice. Who do we follow? I'd rather have Jesus. I'm going to cry. <laughs> and then this little light.
I retire more often, then we'll hear more of that. Huh? I want to thank you so much. I appreciate it. And Mary Ann, <coughs> since we're on this love feast right now, has uh, <laughs> she, Mary Ann has just um, please hold on, has just amazed me with her with the, with the depth of her faith. And and I have appreciated her very much. Marianne and I, um, <coughs> probably theologically, um, are not as close, okay, as maybe I am with other people. But I, that doesn't bother me one bit. What I found about Marianne is, is that her, her acceptance of differing opinions, her embracing of other people who disagree with her, her genuine affection, and, 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 and in fact, real love for human beings is, is remarkable. And I, I want to thank her again. <laughs> And, and obviously, I'm leaving in a couple weeks, and I've mentioned this to the <laughs> Building and Grounds Committee. When I came here, whatever it was, uh, January 1st, uh, 1992, where it happened, Marianne had just gotten here, and she had written this beautiful note on the blackboard downstairs in the, in the far room, and, and drew a picture of an angel. And I had put a sign up there, never to touch that. It's still there. <laughs> 23 years later, 20 years later, what she drew and what she wrote. And so, uh, Garrett, if you have that erased, <laughs> and you may have to, but I want Marianne to thank you again. Please. scripture this morning comes from <clears throat> the Gospel of Matthew. I think we've been reading this yeah. for a few weeks, and so it should sound familiar to you, <laughs> if you've been listening. <laughs> <clears throat> Beginning in chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. <clears throat> Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before people to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by those around. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand, be standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by people. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, Go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father, who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive people their sins, your Father will not forgive you your sins. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Always, oh, Sarah, it's a joy to have you with us and to see you. How long have you 
you've been ordained now? Ten years? Fifty? How many? Four. <laughs> you've been ordained <laughs> You certainly have acted like you have. <laughs> well, I haven't decided what I'm going to do next week or the week after. I may, I may continue it um, on the Lord's Prayer one more time, particularly on this, this pesky little thing about uh, lead us not into temptation. Uh, and that seems to cause people a lot of consternation. I don't know. I haven't figured that out yet. What I do want to talk about is, I think, the linchpin of the gospel, and that's forgiveness. And um, if, if, if Jesus uh, dying on the cross did not forgive us our sins, then we really don't have any business being here. I mean, well, he might be a nice fellow, he might have some interesting ideas, he might be somewhat of a pacifist and worthy of being emulated, um, but he certainly has nothing to do with what we would call salvation, if that's the case. That's all. So if Jesus did not assume the cross, if Jesus, um, whatever, the, whatever it means, by his precious blood didn't forgive our sins, there's no reason to be here. I mean, in a church. I mean, it, it, it's not to say we shouldn't study him, you know. But I, so that it seems to me is the heart of the gospel. It's hard, probably the hardest thing for most people to do. I'm sure it's the hardest thing for most people to do. So we're going to talk about forgiveness. Um, I know that it says, uh, "Forgive us our debts." Is um, we forgive our debtors, it should read, forgive us our sin, as we forgive those who sin against us. That's, that's the way it should read. That's what it means. Okay. Now, one paragraph. First, because it is necessary to acknowledge there are um, some crimes, some sins against other human beings that I personally cannot even imagine myself or any other human being able to forgive. I want everybody to know that right up front. Now, um, some people who apparently have never seen evil, you know, say, well, that's preposterous. Well, I've seen it. And uh, in my 40 years of ministry, I have personally made, been made aware of uh, more than a few uh, events and crimes against human beings that are simply unspeakable. I'll just say this. I had a person, and, and give you an idea, I know I will never mention them to you. And, and the reason I won't is it will ruin your day, your week, and your month. And you'll remember what, I'm, what I would tell you the rest of your life. It is that horrifying. So I had a guy who I happen to like. He's he, a professor, a very fine man, and he's what's called an abolitionist. In other words, he's opposed to the death penalty. And he said, everything, you know, we should never have a death penalty. And he was on me and on me. And I liked this guy very much. And I broke my code of silence and I said, well, what about this? And he threw up in his mouth. And I said, so, you know, don't tell me. Don't tell me ever again about not having the death penalty. So I'm of the opinion that some crimes only God can forgive. And, and whether God forgives them or not, I have nothing to say about it. So I, I want to begin that so that nobody goes away and say, well, David, you know there are some things. Now, there are some things. I get that. And that noted all other tran uh, transgressions, however unfortunate and odious, nasty and emotionally or physically damaging, are to be forgiven. Jesus says so. And I know so. And Jesus makes it very clear, if you don't forgive those crimes, then you are not going to be forgiven yourself. Which seems kind of unfair. But that's what Jesus says. So what I want to do this morning is to first clearly explain what happens when we're sinned against. And then clearly what happens to the victim if he or she refuses to forgive. Okay? It's simple. What happens to you when you're transgressed against? And I'm talking about 
serious stuff. I'm not talking about treatment stuff. And uh, secondly, of course, what happens to the victim uh, if he or she refuses to forgive that person who's hurt them or whatever. When one is sinned against, one suffers a twofold indignity. The first is the insult itself, uh, with the accompanying pain, a possible humiliation or embarrassment. Secondly, uh, one is now yoked to the perpetuator of that crime. you. This is the perpetuator of the crime. When that happens, you're yoked together. Okay? That's what happens. Everybody knows what a yoke is. The imagery is helpful so think of two oxen, cattle, whatever. Once independent of each other, and now held together against their will. Pretty spooky. Against their will, and certainly your will. This uh, yoke is an unpleasant symbol, and it represents a heavy burden that's placed uh, on one's neck uh, that saps the strength and dignity from the victim. You didn't put it on yourself, it was put on you. You had no power over it. No freedom of choice. It happened to you and you are now yoked to something or somebody that you didn't want to have happen. And I, I had a note here, and, and, and I understand the delicacy, delicacies, the, uh, the, the, the sensitivity of this. I am not going to mention possible things that have happened to people, I, and I certainly wouldn't do it, I'm knowing of any of this. Um, but I think everybody here is smart enough to remember what's happened to you. <coughs> okay? So all of a sudden you're yoked to this person. Um, and uh, not only this, you are united with that person who has sinned against you. And worse yet, uh, the one who sinned against you, if he or she is stronger than you, uh, in whatever way, emotionally, uh, physically, uh, mentally, uh, academically, whatever it might be, get this, this is spooky, uh, then you must bend your neck, your very life, to that person's will, and you have no choice in the matter. See, people get on me and say, well, David, you know, we have free will, all baloney. If you're yoked to somebody stronger than you, you have to bend to their demands. You must do their will be done. No, I don't. Well, yes, you do. Yes, you do. Being yoked is a life of emotional and, frankly, spiritual bondage. Or if you don't like the imagery of a yoke, and if it doesn't make sense to you, think of being chained to the person who sinned against you. Again, everywhere you go, um, that person will either drag you along with them or you will have to drag them along. Always being your constant companion. You remain in bondage horribly. You will be defined by that other person. So much about freedom. It's a bad concept in the first place. It is. It's a lie. You will be defined in your soul by the person that you're chained to. 
and you will not have any power over it. You will do what they want you to do. Well, no, I won't. Yes, you will. Yes, you will. And we know this. We know this. And I'm not going to go into the details. I know the people who have been abused, who have been hurt, who have been um, trampled on. And unless they have figured out, which they don't, how to take care of that, even when they're eight years old, they're still trampled on. That person, or you, in fact, may appear in public as well-adjusted, uh, adapted, pleasant enough in person, but there's that secret and that bondage still got a hold of you. And you can lie about it in public, and people do a really good job about that. But that always controls your life or happened to you. Because you're still in bondage. Now, contrary to what many think, and what I may have suggested, one does have the power to be released from such anguish. You already, if you will, have the key to unchain yourself. The power to lift the um, yoke off your shoulders and toss it away. And that key or that power is called forgiveness. Jesus tells us to do it, and I know so. Incidentally, I've done this, and that's why I'm relatively free. And no, 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 we're not going to go into what happened to me and what has happened to me. It's nobody's business. But if it's interesting to anybody, I can match my sorrow and the filth that has happened to me with anything that happened to you. The only thing I haven't done is killed anybody. So I don't, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to hear people say, well, David, blah, blah, blah. No, I don't want to hear that. Forgiveness is the key, and that unlocks the chains, frees you, so that you can live a relatively normal, healthy, safe, enjoyable life. And you don't have to lie anymore about your past, or cover up anymore about who you really are. So there's a question. Okay, David. Why don't people, why don't so many people, or why do so many people then refuse to forgive? And in doing so, choose, there was that pesky little lie, choose to remain in bondage. I'm free to choose to be in bondage. Now follow me very carefully. This is almost psych 101, um, but it's okay. Follow me on this. Why do people um, choose to be in bondage and would rather be in bondage, and, and I mean that, rather be in bondage and be free. Why, why do they want to keep this misery in their lives? Has to do with getting even. Has to do with settling the score. What's that stupid phrase? It was a, uh, I don't get back, I just get even. Who came up with that bad idea? <laughs> I just get even. No, you don't. You get in bigger trouble because you're an idiot. You're a fool. That's what you get by not forgiving. Misery. Anyway, has to do with getting even. Has to do with settling the score. It has to do with inflicting pain. It must be noted the collateral damage of such a mindset is one must, get this, ever rekindle anger, ever rekindle resentment, ever rekindle shame, ever rekindle pain. If you don't, that, that's what you have to do. To keep it going, you have to keep lighting that ember intentionally. I, I've told this story at Bible study. I don't want to lose my place here. I mentioned it once in the pulpit. Not going to mention the woman's name. First church I had, I had a gal, liked her very much, very bright woman, married, good human being, 60 years old, filled with anger. 
Why? Because her father had left her and her mother alone when they were 13 or 12. Okay? So, for over 50 years, this woman hated her father for leaving her. Now, I knew the woman's mother, and I said, I understand why he left. <laughs> So think about this woman. She has spent her adult, well, from age 13 to 50, or well, she was 60, however many years that is, 47 years filled with hate and rekindling that, and then the collateral damage, she got to teach her daughter what a hateful person her father was. Oh, so now we've dragged another human being into this and polluted them with your hatefulness. Uh, because I love Jesus, David. No, you don't. You don't even know who He is. Don't tell me you know who Jesus is. You have no idea. So you take your children, you ruin them. See, to maintain that anger, to maintain that attitude of not forgiving, you have to keep lighting the fire of hatred and of resentment. <clears throat> so the collateral damage is terrible and the question is this when you do that who does it hurt I'm going to tell you a story guess what the person that hurt you doesn't care how you feel they don't care about you <coughs> so when you maintain that hurt and that resentment and that getting even Who's the only person that's hurt other than your children who you damage because you can't grow up? <coughs> Who's the other person? Who's the only person that hurts? Yourself. Now that's sick. I'm not going to forgive. I'm going to hurt myself and teach you a lesson. <laughs> oh boy. You think about that. <coughs> I'm not going to forgive you. I'm going to teach you a lesson by hurting myself some more. Oh, that's great. So here I am, 75 years old, and because my father did this to me, I'm going to hurt myself some more and teach him a lesson, even though he's been dead for 40 years. What kind of insanity is that? And that's what it is. Oh, yes. So what you've done, this collateral damage by not forgiving, <laughs> you've hurt your children, you've hurt your husband, your wife, whoever it might be, you've hurt your, your workmates. How many people have gone to work and had to hear old Sally talk about, well, Bill, that SOB, that shit he did to me. You know, you get to listen to that for 30 years. And you know what? You don't care. Oh, well, that, this, it just hurt me so deeply. Well, Okay, so who does it hurt? It hurts yourself, it hurts your family, it hurts your friends. I mean this, and I'm, and I'm gentle when I say this. Do you know anybody uh, who for a lifetime has had to work on their hate and their anger to justify their behavior about what happened to them when they were younger. I know a bunch of them. And the thing that's so sad about it as a pastor and a practicing Christian as a person who generally cares for people, it's, why do you do that? And the answer is because it's more important to be filled with anger than to be free and filled with joy. Anyway, so by not forgiving, that is releasing her, those who have coupled with us, with the person who has hurt us. You, by not forgiving, um, what you get to do is to relive over and over again, get this, the initial transgression. Think about that. That's what you get to do by not forgiving. Whatever it was that initially damaged you and hurt you, I'm not, I'm not minimizing that pain at all. So don't ever think that. By not forgiving the person, you get to relive that. And if you're 80 years old, and it's happening when you were 15, then you've spent 65 years of your precious life. And if you haven't figured it out yet, life is real short. 
As Ralph Young said, I woke up one day, looked in the mirror, and I was an old man. <laughs> it's real short. And to think that you spent your life hating somebody who hurt you, what a waste of a life. And it is a waste. Well, why? You did it to teach them a lesson. You did it to get even. You did it to inflict discomfort. And that's fine. And again and again. Who gets to suffer? You do. Now, a psychiatrist would just say, I think you've got a mental health issue. <laughs> I think maybe we need to be in therapy for maybe a long time and give you some drugs to help you through this. Because it's so insistent that you hurt yourself. We can't put people, and I'm serious about this, we can't put them in the mental hospitals anymore and put restraints on them. Those who choose not to forgive take judgment and vengeance into their own hands. And since, uh, since the last time I read the Bible, this is solely God's prerogative. Judgment and vengeance. Solely God's prerogative. Those who choose not to forgive are committing a terrible sin themselves. They're playing God. <coughs> judge not lest you be judged, for the judgment you visit upon another person will be visited upon you, Matthew 7. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. That's what Jesus says. Oh, so there's the key. There's the key. Forgiving others. Inasmuch as Jesus has forgiven us, so giving us freedom from shame, guilt, and fear so that we can live productive, adult, adult, enjoyable lives, tending to others, being kind and generous. So too, when we do to the other person what has been given us by Jesus Christ, in some kind of way, we give them the opportunity also to become kind and generous and productive people. Whether they do it or not, it's none of our business. But we do give them that gift. We're to do the same as Jesus has done to us. And we, each one of us, has the key. Every single person here has the key to take the yoke and throw it off and say, I'm done with it. That's what I had to do. I'll never forget this. I took it and I said, that's it. Never again. That's it. It's not mine anymore. Came free at age 12. And I've never looked back on being free. You gotta pick it up, you gotta throw it away, and then you gotta grow up. There you go. For those who have been damaged, I'm sorry. I pray for your release. You have the power to do that. You really do. Amen. Be thou my vision. Those who are able, please stand. 339.
this good day, gracious and heavenly God, you have given us. It is a time to be free. It's a time to be free. I wish freedom for those who remain in bondage. I wish freedom for those who are unable or don't want um, to, to, to cast off um, that which hurts them. I wish freedom for the oppressed. And it comes through Jesus Christ, and I wish Jesus Christ to come into their lives. And I ask that the blessings of Jesus Christ rest upon every single person here, now until the end of the age. Amen. Amen.